Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Time is now 9.50 and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of December 6, 2011 is called to order. Um, the first item is approval of agenda and order of priority and I understand there's, there's one item we're going to, Eileen's going to request uh, be added. Yeah, I, I move approval with the addition of a, a new item C before the current C which is Moved by John with that amendment. I have a second. Board by Dan. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Thank you. Merch, please. Uh, good morning. I'd like to introduce you to the members of the State Board of Education and the people seated around the table here. Mike Flanagan is chairman of the board. He's the superintendent of public instruction. To his left is John Austin. John Austin is the president of the board and he resides in Ann Arbor. Next to him is the vice president of the board, Cassandra Albridge from Rochester Hills. Then there's Nancy Danhoff from East Lansing. She's the board secretary. Kathleen Strauss from Detroit. Paul Goblenski, he's the teacher of the year serving this year seated at the board table and he is from, darn it, I can never get this. Um, he's a CTE teacher in the areas of business, management, marketing, and technology at Oakland School's technical campus southeast in Royal Oak. <laughs> That's a mouthful. <laughs> Across the table is Eileen Weiser from Ann Arbor. That's a mouthful. Dan Varner from Detroit. Richard Ziley from Dearborn. And Richard Ziley is the NASBE delegate to the board. And Mary Ann McGuire is treasurer of the board. She is from Detroit. Thank you. Thank you, Mertz. And Kathleen Strauss, I think, asked for personal privilege for a moment. Thank you. I, I just wanted to remind all of you, all of you know this, but I don't know if the people in the audience are aware of it, that Heidi Caprero, who was our Teacher of the Year in 2000, uh, well, let's see, 2004 or 5, passed away a couple of weeks ago of cancer, and we lost a great teacher and a great educator leader. She was just a wonderful person. Every year we keep saying the teacher of the year is so outstanding, they can't get any better. And every year they seem to get better. Uh, it's just unbelievable. But Heidi was a wonderful science teacher, was in her classroom in Northville, uh, elementary school, sixth grade class, and the place was so alive. It was just wonderful, and the children were so engaged, and uh, she was just an outstanding person, and it, it's just a tragedy that she was taken from us in her 40s, leaving two young children uh, and her husband. And it's just so sad, and I didn't want it to go unnoticed. And I, I know that, uh, that John is sending a letter on behalf of the board to the family. Uh, but I just wanted to have this opportunity to say something about how much we admired her and respected her and loved her. She was just a delight. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kath. Thank yes, you. very sad. <coughs> um, just a few comments up front that um, we thought would be appropriate to make. Susan Broman, who I selected to be the deputy superintendent for uh, the Office of Great Start, um, I think is going to be able to make the January meeting. She starts in January. And uh, as the board knows, but I thought I'd mention it to the public, that we had uh, foundation folks, uh, the early childhood partner uh, folks work on first a paper screening committee and then on an interview committee. And they sent two to me, and one was an out-of-state uh, out -state gentleman, and one was uh, Susan Broman. Susan's the... Susan I knew for 15 years because she was on Ready to Succeed, which was one of the early, early childhood kind of initiatives uh, and had a lot of respect for her, but she obviously um, made a real difference in terms of the committees and they just feel great about her. She's currently the, uh, the head of the Steelcase Foundation, which has done a lot of work in this arena. and. Uh, we're looking forward to her joining us. So I just wanted to mention why she's not here today. She can't start until January to 
wrap up some of her duties, but we expect she'll, she'll be here at that meeting. And then I thought I'd just mention, because I, I thought it was timely, um, I had a, uh, I had a uh, phone conference call yesterday with John Covington and Roy Roberts, John Covington of the EAA, Roy Roberts of uh, the Detroit Financial Manager, and some of the governor's folks, because I felt we needed to clear up uh, some issues in the media again this morning. So I'll just, if I might, just for a moment, I thought just to clear this up up front. It, in, in an excerpt this morning from uh, one of the media folks, it says the superintendent of public construction, Mike Flanagan, can place additional buildings under Mr. Covington's leadership if he finds they are not making sufficient progress in future years, although Mr. Covington is now considering moving up that schedule. I thought I should clear up for the board also and for anyone watching in. More people watch in than I realize. Um, is, first of all, Deb Clemens, as I've said in the past, uh, I appointed as the reform officer, and, and Deb will work with the team here to make decisions about whether schools aren't making enough progress. So it's our call in the law and in, the, in all the other paperwork as to whether or not a school would be placed in the EAA. Um, I think where a little bit of the mix-up is, and we ended up clearing it up yesterday, is Mr. Covington, under the law, um, has the right to accept. So I guess that might infer a right to not accept. Um, but, I, but I think there was some misunderstanding on everyone's part, and we just wanted to clear up that um, the chancellor of the EAA is not the person that could, for instance, go to another district and determine that that district's building is coming to the EAA. And then we've done quite a bit of discussion in-house about this, and, and uh, the bottom line is if a school doesn't get its, its plan approved, then they're subject to kind of an immediate placement, immediate being next September. But that's not likely. In fact, we might be down to all of them approved at this point. <coughs> I know we had eight, two conditionally, and, and hopefully they'll do what they need to do. And then when it comes down to our issues related to improvement over time, and uh, so we'll have more to report on that as time goes on. I just thought the part worth clarifying today, though, is because it, I can see Mr. Covington's going around the state, um, and I think appropriately seeking advice of something that someday will be more of a statewide function. But uh, that's that's not for the EAA to decide, either their board or the or the. Uh, so we've got to clear that up now. He he understands that now. Yes. Because apparently, the, according to the paper yesterday, there are going to be two forums on Friday, one in Detroit and one at uh, Oakland Schools, yeah. about, about what the mission, according to the paper, what the mission of the EAA should be. Well, I thought that was the, I don't know that anybody else has anything to say about the mission, do they? I think at this point, um, especially after yesterday's discussion, it'll be more along the lines of trying to get input from folks around the state as to what this might look like in time. But I think it was important to clear up yesterday before any of these forums that that call isn't the call of the EAA to place in. It's, it's the call of the department and specifically uh, Deb Clements who will mm -hmm. be working with these schools on, on determining whether or not they're making improvement. Uh, Nancy, I'm sorry, please. I just want to know if there's going to be an opportunity to, to ask a couple questions about this at another point today. And if there isn't, then I'll ask it now, but I didn't want to take no, that down. No, please. I brought it up, so. Uh, okay. Um, I, I've, I've called Linda forward earlier, and, and she and I have been kind of playing telephone tag, but here, and when I read that, here's the concern that I have. We have approved a grant money for, in a, in a program that's being, I think it's being administered by... Michigan State, I'm not sure, but they have, um, we have uh, staff, we have people in place as coaches that are helping these groups uh, do just what EAA is going to help those that are in their groups do in very similar fashion. And my question was, how are we going to make sure that both parties know what's going on and that we're not, we're not um, on top of each other and undoing what one person does unintentionally? just because the left doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Um, how are we addressing that? Well, I think that's going to be 
worthy. We have it as a future agenda item. And okay. I think it, as some of this is unfolding, it might be prima it would be complicated for one thing, but it might be premature. You're right, there is a, there is a, uh, uh, an alignment that we need to try to work mm -hmm. through. I do think we have some time. And I think as, as John goes around the state, see, I think one of the things that in, in the best sense they were trying to communicate is that this is not a Detroit-centric uh, EAA. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in that spirit to try to show that ultimately schools that aren't showing improvement on student achievement gains um, could end up in this entity. I think that's the spirit behind some of these. But we'll have more to report at <coughs> and we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll make it a point to have an agenda item. We'll, it'll be a number of months away. I just tried to put myself in the position of one of those coaches that was working with one of those schools and reading that and thinking, yeah. well, and it's a little vernacular here, but what am I, chopped liver? Yeah. I mean, you know, what I've been working really hard with the school. We're making gains. We're making AYP, and now someone else is going to come in and take my job. What's right. going on? I, I think I think a school that fits that description is <coughs> is, is not going to end up in the EAA. Thank you. That's what I was hoping to um, hear. And then for those that that do, um, there's there's time, and I and I appreciate your uh, took a second personal privilege here, but I thought it was important because there's sure. been a lot of misunderstanding about that the last few days. No malice on anyone's part. Actually, some misunderstanding about language and, and the law, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I, as I said, I think the spirit behind that is make it the best it can be from, from uh, uh, John Covington's point of view. And, and knowing that at some point it will be a statewide entity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's just that the placement, by the way, I, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to sugarcoat this. I think it, it's totally appropriate that it's the department that makes that judgment. We don't have an interest in this in any way that could be perceived other than the interest of the children who are in a given school. Um, we will have, by that time, have worked with a school through Deb, but as well as Linda Ford and Mark Coscarella and others who've worked with many of these same schools for years now, so you'd have a real track record of understanding, is there improvement? Do they, are they implementing their plan? By implementing their plan, is there success? And uh, so it, it, there's lots of reasons it's appropriate and why the law and all the other related things to the EAA have spoken to it this way. Thank you. Yes, Dan. Uh, well, <clears throat> since the subject has come up, uh, just really quickly, I talked with Dr. Covington about this, and I, I just want to commend him and would hope that all of us would do so for being willing to go out to the community and have conversations that would solicit input on the design of this system. I think it's important that folks have an opportunity to voice their concerns and suggestions and recommendations uh, and that he and his staff are willing to listen to those and incorporate those into his design. So uh, I, for one, just commend him on being willing to go around the state and have those conversations because so I think it's an important part of this planning process around the EAS. Yeah. Thank you for that. And, and well, if he's calling it the EAS. Oh, he is? That's right. Oh, System no. as opposed to authority. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I hope my comments didn't detract from that thinking. I, I agree with that very much. I just yeah. thought it's worth clarifying because there's a lot of, there was a lot of misinformation from the media and others, uh, as well as school districts, about who makes that call. But I think he's doing, as Dan said, exactly the right thing. Ultimately, this is going to be uh, a statewide entity, which was conceived not just by the EAA. It was conceived in the law a year and a half, two years ago, when it talked about the reform office here at the department. Right. And I think the big improvement that the EAA has brought to the, uh, to the table is we had a law that required that, and then it's kind of like, now what do we do? You know, now the department has these schools, but now what? And, and it really isn't, those of us who've done this for a while realize it really isn't, uh, it isn't something you'd run from the department. I think it, we're in the perfect role to make judgments that without any self-interest and with the idea that it's in the interest of the kids and, and then there's a place for those schools that aren't performing and that's uh, cap. Well, I just wanted to say what, what the article in the paper said yesterday was that the, during the forums, participants will be broken into groups to answer questions such as what should be the mission of the EAA, which core values should drive <coughs> its work, which design elements should be included in EAA schools, and how EAA schools will differ from traditional schools. I don't suppose yeah. any, other any other points people want to say, but those are the issues that 
terribly important work. I think those are in the spirit that Dan uh -huh. described. That's in a genuine interest to try to make this the best it can be and right. do it on an accelerated timeline. So, okay, Eileen, then. please, and then Marianne. <coughs> Because we all live in Acronym City, um, can is it that, that the education, um, the EAA, is the uh, the board, and the EAS is the operationalized system? I, because the newspaper article makes it sound as if the board um, is asking for information, and the board, the EAA, if you can shed any light on this, it'd be great. We'll have to do some homework on that. I, I think that technically it's an EAA. I think it's appropriate to try to understand it as a system, so I think that's why the vernacular has changed, but I'm pretty sure the legal documents would call it something else. I, I, I think John's doing the right thing in trying to under, help people understand this is a system, but I, I, I'm pretty sure technically it's an EAA. <coughs> we can, we can, we'll get that back to you, Eileen, with specificity. Marianne. Um, I'd just like to know where the money is coming from for all of this. I know his salary is uh, from Eli Grove, right? I don't know the answer to that. And what about, what about his his staff and the whole system and well, uh, uh, his whole budget? Uh, you know, I think the philanthropic community stepped up as a... a, a a community, I don't think it's just the one, to say how do we deal with startup costs in order to get ready for next year. Starting next year, the way this is paid is, is it's paid like every other district. They'll get state aid for the children in their, in their entity. So I think it was appropriate to try to get the philanthropic community to come together, say we need some startup time, we can't just on, you know, the day after uh, Labor Day start fresh. So they, they needed some startup <coughs> uh, money. I'm not privy to um, exactly how that's sorted out in terms of which partners stepped up. But that, that sounded like a logical spirit behind it. What's startup money to get it going? Because there's no state startup money at that point. But once that entity is in place and has students, it'll be based on state aid, and, and all the bills will be paid by state aid. Whether or not, just like other districts, other districts get supplemental grants from foundations often, so that there may be more of that in the future, too. I, but again, I'm not... Well, I'm just wondering about the situation with the uh, coaches. If, um, I mean, we've been told we, we don't have enough money for coaches, but all of a sudden now there seems to be money for coaches for this system, this EAA? Well, the EAA doesn't have any coaches yet. They don't have any schools, they don't have any. They're, he's setting up a structure, a system at this point, and I think that's what the philanthropic community is supporting. But as of that date, whether or not uh, Dr. Covington and his staff decide to have coaches or what other, other things they'll do, they'll do it as any other district would. And um, it, it, it's clear from this that we'll probably uh, accelerate our agenda item a little bit when we, when we feel like we have enough meat on the bones to talk more about it. The only reason I brought it up, and, and maybe maybe it was a little premature, was I just think that that we're all on the same page as of yesterday. There was clarity about the law and all the other documents related to the EAA. And I, I think it was important to not have schools especially misunderstand this, um, that they still are going to be respected in implementing the plans they have in place through Deb, through Linda, through others in the department. And, uh, and we'll move on from there. I also think it's appropriate uh, that, that, uh, that Chancellor Covington is out trying to do this in a way that's going to make the most sense for when it's up and running. So I, I, I take that very much in, in good spirit. Do you think we could get him to come to uh, one of our meetings? I'm sure, I'm sure we could. You know, I mean, I don't want to speak for him, but I'm sure he'd be happy okay. to. So maybe at that same meeting, we think a little bit more about that agenda item, that agenda planning. Okay. It's a little bit down the road yet for us to have more meat on the bones, but um, that's a good idea. Yes, sir. Um, next year, when uh, it is operational and a, a good number of schools in there, if not all of them, will be Detroit, from, originally from the Detroit district, will, will their budgets then be separated from Detroit district? Uh, I'm just yeah. thinking about the implications of this for, for the district's deficit. Uh, 
uh, dealings and such. Yeah. You know, I, I'll just speak for myself. I've certainly weighed in that, um, well, I may be overweight in in some folks' minds. I, I think that the current kids shouldn't have to support the total deficit that's been built up over a long time. But that's above my pay grade. So Could if we assume for a, a minute, louder, like, if like we assume, or, or speak into the mic, Mike. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean I, I. Again, this is not my decision. It's above my pay grade, and it's governor and legislature. But since I kind of am on record for this, I just don't think that the current deficit should be on the backs of the current kids, given that it's been developed over a long time. But let's assume that it is likely to be with the district and the district has to resolve it, then at least, and I'm only speaking for myself, uh, have advocated that, that some of that needs to go proportionately if that were the case so that it's not, for the sake of discussion, if eventually, these are just numbers to make a point. If a third of the children left Detroit to this entity, um, you couldn't, you really couldn't possibly handle the deficit difficult even now, but handle it with the two-thirds that are left. Mm -hmm. So I, I think people are thinking along those lines. I don't want to speak for, I can't speak for the governor or others, but I, I think the spirit behind it is trying to figure out a fair way. And, uh, to distribute the debt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I, but I, I honestly think, I just hope the legislature and other parties would give thought to the fact that it, that's, a, that's, a, that's a heavy burden on a much smaller number of kids. When I was the Wayne Reese superintendent, it was over 200,000 kids in Detroit. Some of that deficit started even back then. So I, I think there could be an argument made for that. I know the money situation in our state is severe, so I'm not faulting those that may not see it the same way. But I, I, I think we're asking a lot for kids, uh, whether it's rural poverty or urban poverty, these are we have lots of examples, like in the Beating the Odd schools, of schools with poverty <coughs> that are really doing well in terms of student achievement, so it, it, it's not an excuse. But having said that, it does take more, you know. And so if in addition to the greater burden it might be in a rural or an urban district with poverty to also say now for 15 years of debt, and, you know, I know it. It looks like the deficit's gone down 200 million, but if you read the fine print in the paper, the paper's been papers have been pretty accurate that it's a loan that that it's a good thing to do. It's reduced the debt service. It was a smart thing to do. It doesn't ultimately take care of that 200 million. It, it, it defers some of it. But you know that might be something the board wants to talk about at some point too. But I, I Dan, please. We've. Um, We've taken the lid off of Pandora's box, uh, perhaps, but <coughs> since, it, since we did, um, I, there are, uh, so one thing that we should keep in mind is that Roy Roberts, who's the emergency manager for Detroit Public Schools, is also the chair of the board of the EAS or EAA, depending upon your preference. Um, and while there are potentially, um, uh, well, uh, the bottom line is that because that is the case, I. I actually am fairly confident that we won't see um, uh, an arrangement that leads to uh, further financial distress for DPS. Uh, Mr. Roberts is actually charged. His job is to address that financial distress, so I don't think that he would agree to um, any transition of schools from one entity to the other that would aggravate that distress for DPS. It's actually one of the things that I'm not worried about um, in this arrangement, just to add that thought to the it wasn't Pandora's box. That was a good clarification. And Mr. Bob was supposed to reduce the deficit too. Yeah. Well. It went up and it right. down. Bottom line is, is uh, okay. I knew there was some, there was some tension. So hopefully we released a little bit of that. And my main point, as I said, and I appreciate these other comments, which are very helpful, but would to at least clarify it with the state Department of Ed. We've got Clemens that will make those decisions, and, and we'll make them in a very appropriate way. Um, and I, and I'm, I, I, I think I'm glad I brought this because for a transition, you know, once you're a grandpa, and I got an, any day now, and frankly, if my daughter-in-law goes into, I might leave, you know, and turn this over to Mertz. 
but I thought <laughs> yet another one. Any day, yeah, yep, another one. But I thought now, you're once busy. you're a grandparent, you know this stuff <laughs> really is entertaining. <laughs> it's very entertaining. It's <laughs> where did you get it? I got a good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, in addition to our regular, our regular agenda, I hope. I'm so glad to see you're helping the economy improve in this business. Three of them. Three of them, right. Oh, my gosh. Will Flanagan, any day. I saw my, my daughter in law wrote this morning that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, Committee of the Whole, and I think I'm going to ask uh, okay. Sally, Joseph, and Linda to join us at the table. That's the third. Or did you, would you prefer? I'm sorry. Okay. Mike, I'm really glad you brought that up because I was going to ask Thank a you. question about it later anyway during your report. So awesome. then, Good. glad you did. Thank you. Um, this is the presentation on Elementary and Secondary Education Act flexibility. It's, it's kind of commonly known as the waivers. It's the one that Sally reported out uh, the last meeting that we weren't going to put it in this first round. We weren't ready after they took a team to Chicago that, and CCSSO sponsored a workshop. But uh, John and I spoke in agenda planning. We also spoke and thought this should be an opportunity. This is fairly in-depth we're going to do today because it would give an, a good opportunity for the board to weigh in on these issues that we want to reflect in the, uh, in the application. And, uh, and it will somewhat speak for itself. What we decided yesterday, but you're obviously able to overrule this, we thought by section, if you could kind of, Sally explain in a minute, but if by section you could kind of hold your questions till the end of a section. I think there's four, four areas. Then it might be answered the next slide. We've got a lot of slides, but, uh, but if that could happen. If you can't and think it's very pertinent to that specific side, obviously don't wait. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to <coughs> Sally Vaughn. Okay, so as Mike mentioned, and I think as we talked before, this is an opportunity for the state to secure some uh, relief and some waivers from the No Child Left Behind. As you know, we were waiting for the reauthorization to occur. It does not look as though that is going to occur. So this is another opportunity to make sure that we can get uh, some reprieve for on behalf of the local school districts. So on the first slide, thank you, Joseph. Uh, there were two waiver periods. Uh, remember November 14th, we were ambitious, thinking that the sooner we got in, the sooner we would be able to provide districts with some answers and some expectations for what they could expect for this school year. Uh, as Mike mentioned, we went to the, uh, the Council for the School Chiefs Technical Assistance Meeting in Chicago and just learned a significant amount of information about what other states were doing and really felt that we needed to probably hold back, get more input and uh, look at a little bit more de depth in some of the issues that we were ta talking about. A number of the states that did submit on the 14th of November were race to the top states. Uh, so they already had a, uh, a beginning anyway from the race to the top. And in order to get race to the top, they were already pretty far along in some of their uh, evaluation and student measures. So, uh, so we've taken a, uh, a step backwards. We had another big stakeholder meeting on December 2nd and got a lot of feedback asked for people to volunteer to continue working uh, through the waiver period and the submission. And I'm always generally and uh, gratefully surprised about how many people agree, knowing that we're going to be on a really tight time frame again, that they're willing to help us continue to think through some of these issues. So as Mike sent, mentioned, uh, there are four principles for the flexibility. And, and a couple of them we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, but there are a couple in the middle that have got some real depth that we spent a lot of time with the stakeholder group, kind of walking them through what our thinking was. And that thinking had, th had changed significantly from the November 14th draft. Um, in the flexibility, there are 10 waivers that if, you, if and when you are approved, you automatically get the 10 and the 11th is the option. And I'll talk about that in a minute. 
So go to the flexibility basics. These are the four principles that you, we, we as a state need to respond to these four principles. And if we are successful in responding to the United States Department of Education's uh, criteria, then we will be approved. And if not, the idea is that you go back and continue to work with them. This is not a competitive application. This is something that we, they will work with us until, they, until we get to yes. Uh, that also made the meeting in Chicago significantly different from the meetings that we'd gone to for the Race to the Top, which was very competitive. So all of us were very tight-lipped. We did not want to share any good ideas whatsoever. Uh, this one was significantly different. So people were ready to say, well, here's where we are. Here's what we're struggling with. And it really was uh, a very, very helpful meeting. So on the four principles, the first one is the career and college ready expectations for all students. Uh, I'm going to say this one, for the most part, is almost a no-brainer. There's three subsections to this, to this part. The first one is, has, have we adopted the uh, career and college-ready common standards? Well, you've done that. Another criteria is, are we involved in a, an assessment consortium? Well, we are. But there is one component in here, uh, the second one that Linda will talk about, is how are we transitioning to the career and college-ready standards? They're very much similar to what we've got right now, but there is going to be significantly more in depth. So we're going to have to reach out and uh, make sure that we've got teachers and administrators on board because it is going to make some differences. And Linda will talk about that. But that one, uh, like I said, we're feeling pretty good. That's when on the 14th we thought, well, that one's pretty much a slam dunk. We can go ahead and move forward on that. Uh, the second one is we'll spend a, uh, a good chunk of time on this one. The feds are moving into some different categories of schools, and we'll talk about those and, and how we anticipate that we will come up with that list of schools. The third one is the effective instruction and leadership. Uh, as you know, the Governor's Council has been called forth to put together some models for the state, so uh, we're probably going to have to put something in writing that that is under underway, but we can also talk about what kind of wraparound services can we provide as districts get ready for those evaluation systems. And then the last basic uh, flexibility basic is the reduction of duplication and unnecessary burden. Ironically, probably what a month or two ago, we as the Department of Education already submitted a report to the legislation listing a number of reports and other uh, data elements that we thought could either be eliminated or certainly could be shortened significantly. So. Uh, for the fourth one, we're going to be able to submit what we've already submitted to the legislation on that one. So we're actually in pretty good shape on that one. Continuing on to the flexibility, so what do these waivers mean? This means that the deadline, the 2013-14 deadline for determining AYP where all schools have to be 100% proficient, we can have some flexibility in that. We can redefine what we see as our uh, measurable objectives. And we can also uh, take another look at what do we, how do we want to work with AYP. So that's going to be a big chunk of what we want to talk with you about. We will get some flexibility in the implementation of the school improvement requirements, uh, also on the district school improvement requirements. Uh, in No Child Left Behind, school buildings have to do some things and school districts have to do some things. And this gives us a little bit more flexibility as far as the consequences for buildings not, and districts not making AYP. Gives us a little bit more flexibility on the rural local school district education, the, the, the districts, school-wide programs for Title I. It makes a little bit of a change in how the eligibility is determined. The support of school improvement gives us some opportunities to look at, now that we've got different kind of categories of schools, how are we going to provide support services to a number of those. This new category, reward schools, which we'll go over, uh, gives us the option of providing not just, uh, not just financial rewards, but also how can we provide other rewards such as recognition uh, of their efforts. The highly qualified teachers improvement plan, uh, this changes a little bit of the requirements for the local school districts. If they don't have all highly qualified, it changes what some of the requirements, reporting requirements that they have to provide. It also gives some transfer, uh, some flexibility in transferring funds between different components of some of the federal programs. Uh, including the school improvement grant funds to support the priority schools. And we'll talk you through what priority schools are because that's a new name for us. And then the last one is the, uh, the use of 21, 21st Century Community Learning Center program funds. Uh, this is the one that's optional. And at the stakeholder meeting uh, last Monday, last week, uh, 
I think it was pretty clear that uh, Michigan will, the recommendation would be that Michigan would not apply for this. Uh, the 21st century programs, as you probably remember, they presented here a month or two ago. They've got really good, strong data for the impact that they're making on what's happening with kids. Uh, it, but there's a big emphasis throughout this waiver process about how do we extend learning time. So I think the recommendation from the group is that we should leave the 21st century uh, community learning center programs alone, but we've also got some flexibility. We've got some flexibility with um, the SES, which is the, um, the, sup the supplementary educational services. We've got some flexibility with how districts can spend that money. So one of the things that we talked about with the stakeholder group, maybe that's a way of getting some, uh, some funding to be able to extend the school year. So uh, our recommendation at this point is that we will not be applying for that 11th waiver, uh, but we can talk more about that. Can any of these, if we can each section, but I might have said questions. It's really looking for board insights on these issues too. So that might be an example. Really of one. What? Looking for board insights, board thoughts about these, not just questions. So you're welcome to if it's on the tip of your tongue right now. I didn't mean to I'll, I'll, stifle that. I'll, I'll, the only comment I have, and, and maybe it's just me, but we've all been getting questions about these, what these waivers are and what we're going to be doing and what we're going to be. These bullets are <laughs> wonderful, but there's no explanation behind it. And you just rattle it off really quickly. But is there a way you could email us or something with just, I don't know, two sentences? For what each waiver would yeah, provide? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Just yep. because I yep. think when we talk with, with people, what each waiver would um, it's important that we represent well. Well, and thank you for saying, because that will give you an idea of saying, here's what, well, we, here's, right. here's what we get when we submit these four principles. Here's what we get in return. So, right. yeah, we'll get you something. Well, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you so yep. much. So let's move on to the, the first one, which is the, the career and college ready expectations for all students. And as I said, because of the, the board's leadership on the standards and the consortium, we're in pretty good shape, but we do have some work to do um, on the transition. So Linda? College Ready and the Michigan Merit uh, Curriculum plus the high school <coughs> content expectations and the grade level content expectations. And there's a near one-to-one -one match and where there are differences it's a matter of moving something from one grade level to another because the, the criteria changed about which grade that content standard would be presented in. Uh, so and we were pretty delighted with all that but what we've discovered is that two, two factors that um, the teachers are not necessarily getting the message. It's getting down to the curricular people, it's getting into central office, but it hasn't necessarily filtered down to the classroom. And it, we're also struggling because we haven't really fully addressed what the rigor will look like. Because while the career and uh, college ready standards are about, um, about the same kinds of things, we're going to have more rigor. And there'll be more, more expected of our students to perform at higher levels. And so, that's kind of where we're going. What we do have is an alignment. Uh, when we did the crosswalk, it was a favorable match. Uh, I talked about the rigor for a second. And the <coughs> we have posted the crosswalks already. They're up and um, will also be shared in more depth in the spring 2012 rollouts of, the, of what is involved in the curriculum. <coughs> we are participating in an in English le language learner program which is also about the standards, but it's about the crosswalk of the career and college ready standards and what we would expect and from our English language learners. So we are participating in a, in a um, consortium for that work and moving ahead with that. We are also participating in a dynamic learning maps, <coughs> alternate assessment program uh, based on the career and college ready common core so that our students who may face some learning challenges will also be able to address the common core and be able to at high levels and be able to uh, join the rest of the world in, in meeting high standards. Uh, we have developed a coherent plan to align teacher principal preparation programs with te school teacher and student accountability and we're moving forward on that um, a little at a time. We're just getting the wheels on that and moving it ahead. We do know that we have to continue to integrate the career and college ready standards into the pre-service curriculum and I know that Flora is working toward that end. 
um, we need to realign the pre-service requirements with the knowledge and skills necessary for today's successful teachers and principals. For instance, we will not be able to move forward successfully unless we can move into a digital age. And we, use, we loosely use the term online learning. It doesn't necessarily mean totally online, but some sort of digital learning. And knowing that not only the teachers that we have in the classrooms today are ready for that, and we've got work to do, but also that the students coming out of our, our institutions come out ready for that kind of experience and being able to help our students in an online world will be critical to our ability to fully implement the career and college ready standards. Uh, you all know that you voted and we are improving the cut scores to, so that they're consistent with career and college readiness and so now working with our schools and our teachers about what that means to their practice and work, what kind of work they're going to need to do and that's the issue that gets at the rigor. So we're working with our staff to have some pretty solid examples ready for the spring rollout so that teachers will be able to finally put their hands around what does that look like, what does that mean to what I have to do in the classroom to change my practice for, for our kids. Um, we have included, Joseph can be more specific about this, but we have been in the process of including items on the fall 2012 and 13 meet, so a year from now, that will be examples of that increased rigor. So what might a test item look like that addresses the increased rigor that we're expecting out of the classrooms? And MME, we're building it into the third day, and it will address those common, common standards. We also are beginning to gather potential evidence that rigorous cut scores, this one in writing, um, have resulted in increased student achievement. So we're seeing that as we raise the bar, while it's difficult and stressful at first, Schools are responding, teachers are responding, and students are increasing their achievement level. And you may remember the writing test is the one that was already scaled up to career and college ready standards. And we've seen good score increases and improvements on that. Some of the other things that we're beginning to take the steps on is uh, include the any time, any place, any way, any pace model for learning in the 21st century, which will greatly stretch our thinking and you will be hearing more and more about models to address that as we move forward. But my staff and others in the department are working on what might that look like? And I know, you know other entities are working on it as well. But does that mean, for instance, that students can access learning at two in the morning? We know that high school students are more apt to want to learn at 11, 12, 1, 2. Is there some way that we can design learning models that will help them access learning at that point in time? We have gifted students who can move more quickly. We have students who might need a little more time. How do we accommodate a learning model for that? Some of our existing options include dual enrollment that you're aware of and that we work on across the state. And finally, uh, a big piece here that we think is a, a part of our thinking is the early and middle colleges. How do we increase those numbers? How do we have kids who are ready for a certificate or for uh, an associate's degree at the end of perhaps five years. How do we expand that program to help students be more ready? And finally, the AT and IB programs, are, they're growing and we need to increase their presence in urban areas. And that's advanced placement and the international baccalaureate. Thank you. <coughs> Our challenge is, as I said, how do we develop the teachers and administrators, the workforce, that is prepared to teach both in the traditional classroom and in a new digital learning environment, and how do you plan those successfully for all of us? So let's stop, and we'll call that our first chunk. Yeah, and again, Mike? insights, thoughts, questions. Let's Cassandra. Stop, we'll call that our first uh, a question and um, a thought. Uh, one question, what part of this is required by the feds versus what is something that we are offering as part of our application? I'm, ha I'm not quite clear on which is which. The feds is feds are asking us to outline what our transition will be. Okay. So we just have to offer the transition. That would be the basis for how we put these pieces in place. And so that's just what's required of us because we're trying to implement the career and college ready standards. So all we're outlining for the feds is what is our transition process? How are we addressing this? And as you'll see later, how will we then transition that into um, focus schools or priority schools or some of the other categories that we're going to Okay, and and just a thought. You talked about um, the challenge being uh, the preparing teachers and administrators for both the tr traditional classroom and new digital learning environment. I was actually going to save this for uh, when we go around the table at the end, but I, I visited Clintondale 
high school, I'm sure you're aware, they, are, um, they have something now called the flipped classroom, which I think does exactly what you're talking about here, um, which, you know, if there's a way for us to share what they're doing with other schools, I think it would be really beneficial because I, when I saw, you know, the, the teachers taping their, their classes and then the students being allowed to watch it whenever they needed to and then get one-on-one -on -one instruction, it, it seemed to make a lot of sense. So if there's a way for us to share that, I think that would be great. And indeed there is. We've already brought them into the School Improvement Conference and they've presented there. The Spring School Improvement Conference is going to focus more on digital learning and instruction and we'll be bringing in that model plus others for, other, for schools across the state to understand what's happening or needs to happen in classrooms. Great. You know, I just wanted to mention, I wanted to confirm it with Deb, but here's a great example of a school, as Cassandra is saying, that's doing some outstanding work from the PLA list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and why we need to be thoughtful about how these schools are doing. Are they making progress? Now, it still needs to be determined, are they making progress? Right. I'm visiting it coincidentally also, and it is a lot of, uh, right. this is a lot of kids, it, 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 when you think of what you just described, where Particularly, it's particularly easy to envision in a, in a lecture-oriented class where they're seeing, in effect, the podcast at night and then getting help, you know, because at night they're home alone, not getting the help by definition, so why not flip that? And I thought it's a great example of a plan that was submitted to, to, to Linda, to Deb, and, and really saying we're going to really do what we need to do to make it better for our kids, and they were on the list. So, I mean, it's a, almost a great example of our earlier conversation where we have high hope for their progress, and if it continues, that, that uh, they should continue. I think it was John and Kathy and Marianne and Nancy. Linda, at the beginning you said the, the message has not been getting through to teachers. <coughs> what, what is the message that you're talking about? What, what, is, what are the new expectations? What are the is, is that what's not getting ready? through, that the fact of the college and career readiness standards? I'm trying to understand what is not getting through to the front ranks, I guess. What, what the new rigor levels will be, what the new expectations will be. It's easy for them and everybody else to see that there's this one-to-one -one match or, oops, we've got to drop this down or push that up. That piece is pretty easy. But understanding that there will be far greater expectations to be able to synthesize, to be able to access knowledge in different ways and then give us solutions back, it's not... Well, you know, is this answer A, B, C, or D, but can you write for us and explain uh, what your, your hypothesis is and then take it out to a, a, a writing to, to a conclusion, that, that component is not well understood at this point in time. And so um, Lois and I were visiting on that earlier today, and we've been working with the MEA as well, and we're going to look for opportunities to connect directly with teachers. Kath, please, and then Marianne. <coughs> I had a couple of questions. When you yeah, mentioned, candy. when candy. you mentioned, uh, well, nobody else talks into it either. Don't no, 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 pick no, on me. <laughs> 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 uh, you mentioned kids want to do something at two o'clock in the morning. I was at a meeting yesterday in the Michigan for Public Education, and one of the, the, the principal of an alternative school under the auspices of Berkeley School District in the South School and their kids from all over. She said they actually do do it at 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh. And, and, they, and then they come into the school sometime later in the day, like at noon or something. And, and it works. I mean, these, kids are, these kids were like dropouts, most of them were almost dropouts. And they're succeeding. So I live in Ireland. I had dinner with a board member last night oh. from that district, and he was talking oh, yeah, about that program. Right. That's a very good program. I've been at that school a couple of times, and it's really very impressive. And the other thing that, that Susan mentioned, he was talking about rigor. I keep talking about relationships, 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 and I, I want to bring it up again. Somehow or other, what makes that school work so well, I think, is the personal how do we get how do we get that across to everybody all over? All, all three of the R's have to be stressed. Yes. And so the relevance, the relationships and the rigor. We need to give teachers concrete examples, especially the rigor, but it can't be absolutely. Yeah. I can perfect. 
but they also had to develop the relationships. So somebody had to develop the relationships, like the principal, the assistant, whoever, the secretary. Every student needs another cared for by somebody. <coughs> One of the buildings that I worked in, um, Mr. White was a custodian, and he saved a lot of kids that yeah. none of the rest of us could reach. Yeah, I've heard of that too. So I'll have some, I have some other questions about some of the other stuff. Can I do that now too? You mean the other items? Yeah. It, it, would you mind when we get to that one and we'll... Oh, it's already? No, please. They can do either, they can do summer school, after school, for the, for the 21st century learning. One of the advantages of that after school, for a summer school after program, was that it was different from the school day. And some of the kids that didn't thrive during the school day came alive and benefited from the different approach that was done in the after school program. To just extend the day and make it longer, it's not going to necessarily be better for some kids. They're not going to, they're just going to turn off. Well, and we've had... I don't completely agree with not applying for that because I think that would be a good, I think that would be a good thing to have. Well, and we talked uh, with the stakeholder group and among ourselves, and, and one, we shared the same concern, is that if we opened that up, would it be more of the same but just louder? Yeah. And if that's the case, then we didn't think that was probably a good, a good purpose of those funds. So we started thinking that if, the, if a school wanted to extend the school year, and they would, we would probably put some parameters around what that would look like. Uh, but on the other hand, if a school is really doing some great things and they want to extend the school year, then why wouldn't you want it to extend? So I don't know if you can make a one-size-fits-all for that, but just based on the feedback and the, and the data that the 21st century learning programs have been able to demonstrate uh, that they presented to you a couple months ago, uh, and because we had this other funding source with using the supplemental education services funding, that that might be a way then of using those funds to extend the school year. But again, do we want to put some parameters around what that might look like so it doesn't become more of the same? Okay, well, I, I have questions about that. Okay. So, okay. Put my two cents in. I'd like to keep this toward the after school program. Right. We are keeping yeah, that this after is, the school program. I think program. we're on the same page. I think I think this would be on the same. We're page. not. Rec we're recommending that we do not apply for the waiver to use the 21st Century Learning School in a different way. I think what we're going to do, by the way, because I'm guilty of this too, is we're going to get those Madonna stage microphones, and we'll just have them so that they come right around to our. Mike, you're working on that, right, buddy? Wherever you are, we. I think Marianne was next, and then Nancy. <laughs> I just, I have a suggestion, um, and, and it's based on, on the fact that we're talking now about added rigor, um, and you're talking about um, uh, upping, upping the ante on the meat in uh, 2013. Um, might this not be a good time to maybe think about moving the meat? to uh, spring of uh, 2014? So we actually will be moving the MEEP to spring in 2014-15. Oh my. When we go to the Smart <laughs> There you go. Did I call that? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> You've been reading your emails again, Marianne. Um, so w when we go to the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium assessments, we will be moving that to the spring. Okay. Um, that doing it once and then doing it uh, doing it in 2014 and then switching to a new program in 2015 probably isn't the wisest course so we we think that we ought to wait until 2015 to make that move okay i i, I think i see what you're saying yeah. okay <laughs> nancy then dan nancy then dan to make sure this is on now um a couple of thoughts. Um, in your banner on your presentation here, you talk about college and career 
writing the st um, as, uh, assessments, or not, or not assessments, I mean. Um, standards. standards. No, not standards. Uh, let me get back here to what your first one was. Ready expectations for all <laughs> students. And then you switch the language to standards. And this is part and parcel of being on this board too long. I think Kathy will recognize as Marianne will too. Uh, John probably. Um, <laughs> and uh, no, no, it's just I was trying to think. Yeah, you, John and Eileen. We were cautioned against changing standards when we started talking about grade level content expectations and course level content expectations because that opened a Pandora's box already used here once, but hey, it seems to apply to education. <laughs> got a lot um, of boxes too. <laughs> uh, so I guess what I'm, my, my question slash comment is, I'm wondering if it makes sense to be clear about what it is we're changing and what it is we're, we're um, uh, bringing to, together. Is it really standards? Or is it expectations? And if we're talking about those long tomes that we passed one after another in each of the grade level and content level, then we're talking about expectations. And I've talked to enough people on, on the ground, teachers, principals, who are just, they're, they're just scared to death that we're changing the standards on them again. And I don't think we are. I think what we're changing is expectation rigor. Would, is that true, or do I not have that right? You're, you're pretty much on target. This, although the standard, the college and career, or career and college ready standard, did change a bit from what we had in place, what we crosswalked those two were the expectations. Okay, good. To see whether or not the expectations were aligned with when okay. the good. standard would kick in. So at what grade level we, might we expect this sort of thing to kick in? So it's been crosswalk to the expectation. Great. That's, I, and, and I think that that's something that, that everyone will understand and, and, and agree to. I, and, and I, I just was starting to get red flags waved in my face about, wait a minute, we already went through this once and we said we weren't going to do that. So um, Nancy, are you saying that we should be careful when we're using the word standards or just clarify which one we're talking about? If in fact you're talking about a standard, of which underneath it lie several expectations. Okay, so we need to clear. Okay, that's helpful. That's you know, I think that that's something that, that just clarifies for people what we're talking about. That's helpful. Um, and secondly, um, when we talk about rigor, especially in college and career readiness, something I've been getting, um, I don't want to say it's pushback, but certainly lack of understanding from the business community and from the communities at large that I, that I happen to interact with, is well, well. How is that going to be reflected on the MEEP? I thought we were ta talking about. I thought we were talking about um, content that kids were learning. Well, we are, but you're talking about career and 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 they, they they transfer in their mind career to business qualifications. And so I think that while um, while the um, tools that we give young people to to be successful in both the classroom and in their post-secondary lives truly do um, mesh with business and community and s society and all of that. It's not that we're really changing questions on the MEEP or the merit exam, um, at least I don't think we are, that would be business questions. Um, and, and, and so, again, I'm just sharing these comments that I'm getting, just because I think that, that we're, we know what we mean, <laughs> but, it's, but it's important that I think we help our communities, parents, and business people who support these things, and thus the philanthropy world who is then willing to support part of, our, part of what we do financially to help them be clear about what it is they're supporting. Um, one of the conversations that I had last, I had, I had a wonderful opportunity to take one of the students in our, my program to a college visit yesterday. Um, and on the way home, it had become clear to this senior from a Lansing school that, oh my gosh, there's a lot to this. <laughs> and I didn't realize how, de how different college was. 
And he said, wow. he asked, it, it was interesting, he asked me a question. He said, is it really harder to go to college than it is to go to high school? And I said, well, it depends on what you mean by harder. I said, you're still going to be reading, you're still going to be thinking, you're still going to be doing homework. The differences, there are several differences, one of which is that you will be asked to do it in a, at, a, at a greater level. I said, in, in high school, currently, are you having to write papers quickly or think quickly about items that you've just read, and they might not be items anymore, but whole books? And are you having to hypothesize about what you read and to form conclusions and to verify what it is your conclusions are with what you've read? No. And I said, then that's going to be different because you will have to do that in college. And I think this is something that when you talk about the field not getting this, they, they haven't made that transition of rigor. I think the very simple, and it, and it isn't simple, I don't mean it simplistically, I mean the very clear representation of what it means to take a class in history in high school and now transfer it to college and what will the expectational rigor level will be, I think that, that will, that's something that, that is very, um, it was easy for me to explain to this young person last night. His eyes opened wide. <laughs> and I said, so what does that mean that you're going to have to do more of? And he said, I'm going to have to plan my time better. And I think that's exactly what we're getting at. But it was a very clear representation to me last night about this rigor that we're talking about that needs to come up <coughs> in our high schools um, without being really scientific and detailed. So I offer that for what it's worth as well. But thank you so much for doing this. Joseph, did you want to speak a little to Nancy's point about the business items, the so-called business items on the test? We do not anticipate changing the item type significantly until at least until we get to the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium. Um, there may be some pieces that of uh, the Common Core standards that are new that we will put items onto the MEEP and onto the MME that uh, for those few standards that were new in, in the in the Common Core so that people will get a sense of what is it that this is going to be measuring, how are we going to be measuring it and, and how will students <coughs> do on that. So um, we will be putting those on. Uh, they will not count towards student scores because the, this really is new. It won't count until 2014. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, please. Dan and Kat. Um, uh, one quick thing, not related to this presentation really, but tying back to the, uh, the fall versus spring exam. I did read that email that you sent uh, with um, uh, pretty carefully. It was a, um, as, as opposed as I am to a fall exam, it was a uh, reasoned and thoughtful response, so thank you for sharing it um, uh, as it did alleviate some concerns or at least help me understand why we can't move uh, a little more quickly to a spring exam that I think would, would be uh, fair to all. Um, that having been said, so on this presentation, um, so thank you for that. On this presentation, so uh, with regard to this anytime, any place, any way, any pace model for learning, and we've got these three things that are kind of existing options that we need to explore further, dual enrollment, et cetera, um, being the one that I want to explore. So what is your thinking today? I mean, from a policy perspective, what's your best thinking today about how to expand dual enrollment programs? I think, I think that one of the biggest challenges with dual enrollment right now is that in the, in the schools, there there's a perception that this is not something that is uh, financially a gain. In high schools. In high schools. Uh, that it's not a financial gain for them. In fact, it might be a financial expense because if I send out 20, 30 of my students into dual enrollment and I'm paying the tuition and the fees and that sort of thing, that's coming out of my budget. However, if we can help schools understand that if they would send out 200, 300 students, or if we can find ways to infuse the, the, um, the instructor into the actual high school, and not, currently that'd be a violation of the law, but if we can figure out a way to, to make that transition, then schools will recognize that it can be a cost savings. And still, <coughs> while well, you and I might argue that ethically or morally they ought to do it anyway, it's the right thing to do. We're also going to have to find a way to make it cost efficient. So we will be.
be exploring that model and see what we can do to extend the dual enrollment option to more and more students, thereby, therefore, creating a cost savings. I need, I still need my my uh, government teacher. <coughs> if I've only sent five or ten kids up, I might be able to utilize that government teacher with the university or the college if I send out two or three more students. And if I could add to that, Dan, I, I think if I think if we get to a point where we envision that all kids would be able to, <clears throat> no later than the end of 12th grade, get at least the equivalent of one year of college credit, if not go for an extra year and get a community college degree also. If we can envision that, then schools can plan with those multiple pathways, dual enrollment, concurrent credit, that you start to plan for your staffing and you don't have the problem that Linda just talked about. When I was a local superintendent, the problem we always had with, in that case, Oakland Community College was exactly what Linda's saying, that you lost a few kids, you lost the, the money that went with it, but you didn't have enough to change your staffing. But if you really start planning for, virtually all kids can get this credit. So they're leaving with not only a high school diploma, but a year's worth of kind of credit, then you would when you staff before April 1, you'd be thinking differently about that. And it wouldn't be, it wouldn't, you know, there's a transition to that. But districts, are, summer districts are doing that now. And, you know. So that was my follow-up question. Is there a model district in the state or two or three that uh, we can point to that seem to have gotten to the volume where they're able to change their staffing structures? No, we're not aware of any. Well, that would have that many. I would say well on its way would be the ones at least that have the the, the early college, middle college, of right. course. Well, but, right. um, a little bit of a different things. animal, but yeah. Right. I mean, from a, a career and technical education setting, that's exactly what we do. Students are able to, through Oakland Community College, uh, receive college credits for the coursework that they've done at the technical campus. Your average so, student leaves with how many credits? Well, and it, and it varies, and when we look at that, we, we have students that can leave with six, nine. I shared earlier at the, some of the board meetings, we had five young men two years ago that left with 24 college credits at Oakland Community College, along with stackable certs, an IT cert in A-plus and an IT cert in Network Plus. So the, the career and technical education component does provide that opportunity, and we work with other colleges and universities where there's uh, some direct college credit that the students are able to earn as well through our entrepreneurship program. But through career and technical education, that's specifically in BMMT, the business management, marketing, and technology, but the other areas also have those agreements where the students are doing that type of work while in high school, meeting the requirements to graduate with a high school diploma, but also then have an opportunity to have a starting point at the community college. So if someone was able to average six, eight, 12 college credits uh, when they were able to leave, that is uh, an element that uh, is definitely beneficial for the student. And probably the CTE programs statewide have done the best job of being a model for that. Uh, either with, I mean, they've had articulation agreements in place for a number of years, but they continue to accelerate <coughs> it. So those are probably the best, the, the best examples and models. <coughs> And, and certain the vehicle can be the high school requirements that the board passed and the legislature ultimately passed where you work arrangements with your local entity, often the community college, to say in effect that a bi biology credit will count for both. I mean, there's, there's this opportunity in there for making sure that if you're going to take rigorous biology anyway, let's take rigorous biology that's also going to get you some credit. There's some issues related to colleges at times, which I think uh, a number of entities are trying to break down that um, uh, make that more difficult. John can speak to that probably easier from the Cherry Commission days. Uh, John, you're up anyway. Well, I just, um, this is a <coughs> important, huge topic that we have not figured out how to advance. Uh, we need to keep figuring out how to advance it. You know, as Mike alluded back to the Cherry Commission, we're trying to figure out how does the state get more serious and effective in expanding early college credit taking of all sorts for at-risk and high-flyer kids, which both benefit. Expanding the number of early and middle colleges, uh, 
expanding and treating this disincentive for participation in dual enrollment, uh, expanding the acceptance of credit and the partnerships between uh, high school and community college CTE programs, uh, you know, trying to figure out the creative ways, as Mike and the team have been, uh, to do more of that. The states that have really done dual enrollment or AP credit taking at scale have basically paid for it. You know, they've, they don't take money away from the K-12s to pay for the college courses. They pay them both. And, and so uh, we, you know, I was hopeful the governor in accelerating attention to this with any time, any place, uh, any way, any, you know, whatever the last any is. You know, embedded in that is an understanding that we've got to do more of this and that he might be proposing as part of the recent talent workforce message some uh, more uh, tangible, all right, how do we finance it? How do we do it? That didn't happen. So I think we need to continue to advance this uh, agenda and figure out how we do more of it. And I would just say that um, we'll probably talk a little bit more about this under your budget item later, but the very things that the board talked about at the table and presented in their papers were exactly the things that we presented that I think could give some impetus to this if it were accepted by the governor and others in a, in a state aid plan um, along the very lines that you're kind of describing. So others, Richard, please. Yeah. As I, as I think about some of these, I, I just want to throw out a few, I guess, ideas of caution to give us perspective. Without naming names, you know, some districts in, um, uh, some high school districts in Michigan are, uh, the students average performance is about two years behind the national average. And again, without naming names, although I think you had experience with one of them, uh, the, the high schools perform about two years above the national average. It, it makes sense then if you do the college credit that the districts that have students performing above the national, the national average for high school performance presumably are going to accumulate, you know, one or two years of, of college credits. But is that really to their advantage? Students from the more competitive high schools tend to go to the more competitive colleges where the biology one at, at Amherst is more demanding than biology one at uh, Grand Valley State. No, no offense to Grand Valley State, but um, so um, I'm, I'm just that word of, of, uh, of caution. I'm, I'm not sure that facilitating a lot of, of uh, college credits for uh, our better performing high schools is necessarily going to be to the advantage of, of, our, of our students in the long run. Um, the other caution has to do with the anytime, anywhere, any, any place. You know, there, I'll tell you a story about a guy named Jim who, you know, he didn't show up to school and he didn't like to get the places on time. I, I resonate with Jim. Um, <laughs> and, and his high school worked very hard with him and they got tutoring and online stuff and, and he was able to get his high school diploma. And then he went out to get a job. And of course, he couldn't hold a job because he didn't like to show up on time or, or do, he only wanted to work when he felt like it. Some of the business <laughs> skills that, that our graduates are lacking are, are not the academic skills, they're the life skills. The, the, the time management skills, I think, that Kathy had brought up. And, and that's what some of the, the most annoying things about school taught us some of those more basic skills. And by all means, we should accommodate to students. And I, and I think these um, other techniques are uh, certainly to be explored. But, I, but whether they're relevant for the needs of the student in a district, I think, needs to be a district level decision, not a mandate from above. You know, if I may just add one, to your point about the, uh, the reason we keep, we, I mentioned at the last meeting, we're trying to use the word concurrent credit more often to be an umbrella, yeah. because in the cases you're describing, and, and, I, and I know you didn't mean to exclude this, but I think it's not just the high-performing schools. There are high-performing kids in all schools that if, if we offer more AP as an example, they're going to be ready for AP they're going to get that level of rigor for Amherst as well as I know that Grand Valley in Missouri, you meant the Grand Valley, the Missouri yeah. Grand Valley. And, uh, but I, I think that's part of this whole piece is how do you, you look at a lot of these schools that um, aren't where we'd want them to be maybe in terms of their aggregate, they have increased 
the opportunities for advanced placement, and, and many of these kids step up to that then, especially with the proper guidance and support. And then they're getting what you're getting at, I think, appropriately, Richard, which is the kind of rigor, especially when they get you know the right score mostly. And if I may just respond, I, I think one of the great advantages of, of this is you help, is helps to create a culture that prizes achievement. So I think that's one of the, the benefits to, to be looked for. Yeah. Well, and we've got a lot to cover with this flexibility, but the, the, the biggest payoff is not for high achieving students already, it's for heretofore low achieving students in underperforming schools. I commend to you and can get you the Community College Research Center and other research which is very powerful and the middle colleges themselves that says the biggest benefit for early college credit taking and at risk and uh, AP, early AP credit taking is for underachieving students who are thought of at risk because for the very reasons you just articulated, it gets them engaged in thinking and expecting they can succeed and tasting what it's like to do post-secondary work. So poor performing students from poor performing schools can benefit most by participating in early college credit taking of all forms. Seems very worthwhile. And that's, you know, that's a big reason why we've got to do more. Yes. Nancy, then Eileen, please. I appreciate your comments, John. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different bent on that. Um, I agree that, that low-performing students benefit greatly. However, I also know from experience that those students who are considered um, uh, troubles in the classroom, we'll call it that, and it may be from sheer boredom, also benefit greatly from that. And they are not necessarily low-performing students, but they are students for which our traditional um, classroom setups don't necessarily work real well. And I think it's important that we consider that as well, that if we can engage those students, keep them from dropping out, keep them from being the, quote, trouble in the classroom, but rather engaged in education, we have benefited greatly by being able to allow them this alternative method or means or opportunity to, to have education um, and be successful in future life. That's right. Eileen, please. Uh, I, <coughs> I was going to suggest that uh, when we get to item G that we consider including something about uh, middle college uh, uh, funding for uh, both either communicate either either some solution where we define it as to how other states have done it or that we emphasize it uh, because I can't hear a thing but I think we're getting along <laughs> by the way I do want to say since my daughter-in-law and maybe listening is, the, is an associate uh, admissions officer at Grand Valley they have the second highest GPA now of their entering class. It's uh, past one of the other universities and it's re right behind that, that, that other one. That, uh, <laughs> she'd kill me if I didn't I hear, give I the hear. propaganda out. Please, I Kath and Paul. I was curious as to what are the things that we're adding that are different? I don't have the specifics of what are the new standards in the Common Core, what, what really is new over what we had in the grade level content expectations, so it's not something I can answer at the table. But, uh, we, can, we can work on that and get that back. Thank you. Paul, please. And I just wanted to make one other comment when we take a look at, and, and I think what you know, Richard was explaining, you know, the work habits, the work skills that uh, that students are lacking or so employers are saying they are lacking uh, when they come into the workforce. That is a very integral part of career and technical education. We base 30 percent of our students' grades on time management, work productivity, those work habits that are in there. So I think that's another area that can be explored when you look at grading uh, scales or systems. And we do that all electronically where they are able to have that immediate feedback both when things are very positive and then when things need to be corrected and work with it. And so I think those are some of the elements there that we look at. A lot of the times when we're looking at, and I think it's, again, it's just a perspective of what people feel. They want to look at alternatives. I think a lot of this is it just needs to be married together because it does make sense. And when we talk about engaging and hands-on and all of those items, 
people say, well, that tends to be career and technical ed. Well, okay, but why, why wouldn't that then be? That's a good thing to celebrate, right. to bring that in right. and work with that so that we're at that level. I think that's important. And the other part dealing with the fact of looking at the funding piece, which I know we're not able to address here, but when students are in particularly my classroom and earning the college level credits because they have to prove that they have that knowledge base, um, I think that we can be very effective in laying the foundation for that because we can attack and provide multiple areas as opposed to singleton classes that may be required um, you know, at the community college level. So if you build the foundation, they're able to earn the stackable certs, they're able to earn high school credit and college credit, and then that partnership with the community college or a local university, that platform I think works extremely well and you have to obviously continue to fund the K-12 element there so that you can provide that form. But I see amazing thing happen with my students each and every day, and they catch fire when they pass those national exams. Springtime in the classroom is phenomenal. Just as in Michigan, we like it because we're coming out of winter and it seems to be phenomenal. But when those students have spent that year studying and the payoff is those national certifications that they're earning, globally recognized certs, it is phenomenal for what it does for a student in terms of not only a stamp of approval of their skill set, but for them as a young person saying, you know, I can do this and I can do more. Great. Thank you. Eileen, then Kath, then we'll move on to item two on this. Which is going to be substantial. That's okay. I'm really sorry because I've been to three major meetings since our last board meeting. I've been trying to figure out where to bring all these things up. but. One of the things that um, one of the things that I heard at a um, uh, a teacher prep conference for community colleges and four year institutions uh, about three weeks ago was that the uh, ed schools are not getting kids who know enough about technology in K through 12 to be able to have give them college level work uh, in the first two years of school and then build on that to show them how to instruct using technology. Uh, a lot of kids are getting to community colleges with no real knowledge of how to use Word, Excel, PowerPoint. They, they, understand, they don't understand how to cut and paste. They, they may have put together a, a term paper, but they don't have the intrinsic knowledge that they need to be able to function. And the ed schools are finding that unless that's addressed someplace, they cannot build on something without, and this is the platform you're talking about. I understand that. Thank you. And just, just one piece there, and I know we have to move on, but what's happening is those exact courses that are available for students are disappearing within the curriculum and there are some that the only time they ever had an apps course is in the seventh or eighth grade and so we know how quickly that changes and so there are districts out there that because of the cuts to meet the mandates and the things that are there they were all there before but they had to be reduced and so sometimes now they're just offered in the middle school and then if they don't reconnect, reconnect with it at a technical campus or at a high school that has those, that's the only time that they were ever exposed to address exactly those issues. And from seventh, eighth grade to when they're at college, things have changed dramatically within that technology. Yeah, and then Nan. talking about project-based education, project-based teaching in a lot of places. We heard a presentation on that yesterday. And it's, it, worked, it seems to work. I've been to high schools where they actually use project-based teaching. That seems to work very well. But I don't know if we're incorporating that what we're talking about teaching. Are we doing that? Yeah, there, there are a variety of methodologies where you can incorporate greater rigor, but also the project-based learning with um, community-based learning with uh, blended learning models, with a flip model, there are a variety of ways. And we would argue that increased rigor isn't necessarily ugly. It can be a lot of fun because it's going to immerse the student into actual <coughs> practice and then have to interpret what they find out of that practice. Okay, because a lot of this reaction, I think, is too hard for a lot of students to turn us off. Maybe they're not getting to it in the right way. I'm sure that those two come into play, and as Sally said earlier, rigor isn't really about louder, it's right. about different. 
that it's about how do we engage them in meaningful activities that help them delve deeply into whatever the topic is that we want them to learn and then get them involved in a, an ongoing dialogue and, and conversation both in paper and verbally about that and to go to the, the, the technical side I would argue that we need to put out some models that will help schools figure out how to uh, embed the technical education so that the computer is just an everyday piece of technology that we use just like we use paper and pencil today. Thank you. Thank you. Nance, and then we'll move on to the second one. Just a quick comment on what Paul just brought up in response to what Eileen brought up. So this is Nancy bringing up what Paul said, what Eileen said. Um, <laughs> and we understood what you just said. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm surprised I said anything. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, we have a vicious cycle here that was just described that needs to have a crosswalk as well, it seems to me. If we have in our curriculum, uh, if, if as a district, as a school, we have, we have put into our curriculum a time when people learn, young people learn applications to technology that will then infuse their, their knowledge learning um, across their, their learning career, and then do not immediately make that then embedded in what, how it is we teach all the other classes. You're right. Those content standards will, or nope, content <laughs> expectations will be lost within, I don't know, a matter of days for some and weeks at, at best for others. And so I think this really speaks to the crosswalk that you're talking about, and I'm glad you're doing it, because clearly embedded technology, embedded ways of learning differently will not take place if once learned are never used. So thanks. Thank you. Sally, please. 